Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining uh, this meetup. Uh, I'm happy to uh, to have another one. And uh, we took a break at the end of last year, but I aim to have a meetup every month uh, from now on. Uh, now for the uh, ones that are joining us for the first time, I'd like to share what the uh, what the purpose of uh, this meetup uh, is. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, interesting topics and first time speakers to the Laravel community. Uh, you won't see any of like the big or known uh, names here, but these are all people with very interesting ideas that I think uh, deserve their uh time in the in the spotlight uh, as well if you think you have like a good subject that you want to present um, uh, then share your idea at uh, meetup.laravel.com there's a form there where you can um, uh, where you can submit an uh, an idea and I'm open for everything uh, for like simple ideas complex ideas long talks short talks it's all good. Just uh, just send them to me. Now for uh, the meetup of today, uh, we have uh, two guests. Um, later on, as the second speaker, we have Kevin, and he'll be uh, talking about a strategy for a single database multi-tenancy in Laravel. And it seems that multi-tenancy is like an evergreen subject in the Laravel community. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. But the first speaker uh, that we'll have on is uh, Tony uh, Messias, and he will be talking about uh, Hotwire in Laravel. Let me bring him on. Hey, Tony, how are you doing? Hello. I'm doing great. Thanks for, thanks for being uh, on, uh, on this meetup. Um, I've been looking forward to this talk yeah, ever since that uh, DHH uh, shared uh, stuff about Hotwire. Uh, and you have immediately jumped on the subject, right? Yeah, like uh, uh, those who know me know that I'm a uh, base camp aficionado, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I'm always reading stuff that they put out and reading um, they pull requests on Rails and trying to learn how they build applications. So, yeah. Cool. I was kind of so ready when it came out. <laughs> so for uh, people that uh, don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself or where are you from? What kind of projects are you working on? Uh, how did you get a uh, first experience at Laravel? Yeah, sure. So I'm Tony. I'm from Brazil. I've been working uh, with Laravel since version, version 4 came out. Um, before Laravel, I used to do Cake PHP and also some vanilla PHP projects. Always as a full stack developer, um, I've worked with a variety of different you know, kinds of applications <laughs> before. But yeah. nowadays, I'm working for Worksite Safety, a Canadian company. Um, they do safety training for organizations, and I'm helping them building the new version of the website and also. Uh, the new version of a LMS application, and we are using Laravel there. So, cool. That's nice. Um, okay, now that people know you a bit, I'd say just take it away, Tony, uh, and uh, share us everything that you know about Hotwire. All right. So, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me know when you can see it. Yep, we're all good. Awesome. So yeah, today we're going to talk about Hotwire. Uh, first, what is Hotwire? It's an alternative approach to building modern web applications without having to write much JavaScript. Uh, it's an alternative to SPAs and having your backends as APIs. And also, it has a bit of native. So we are not going to be covering that native aspect of uh, Turbo and Turbo Native. In this talk, we are going to mainly focus on the on the web portion of it. So, yeah. Um, so the, this technique of sending hot wire, by the way, means HTML over the wire. That's what the, the name means, which is cool on its own. Um, this technique consists of combining three different tools. So first, and you know, the heart of it, it's 
Tubo. Tubo is the successful successor of the previous uh, Tubo links, and you might be you, know, you might have heard of it before, but yeah, Tubo is the new version of it, and yeah, better, so stronger, and all that. Anyways, so we are going to be focusing on Tubo in this talk, and well we can get out of Tubo. Um, the second tool is Stimulus. So as we are going to see in the talk, um, you don't need to write much JavaScript to get an interactive application. But for those pages where you need a lot of interactivity, you can write it. You can write your JavaScript using either Stimulus or Alpine. Alpine or also works. Um, so yeah, as they claim here, Turbo will get you 80% there. And for the rest, or for the other 20%, you can use Stimulus or Alpine. Why those two? Because the technique consists of sending in HTML over the wire. So you will, we are going to be inserting and uh, replacing HTML elements from the screen. So it, it's good that. Uh, the HTML, the JS behavior is encoded in the HTML that enters the DOM, basically. So that's a characteristic of both of these uh, JS frameworks. And the third component is Strata. Strata is not released yet, but it, it seems to me that it's going to be a, a, an addendum to what is already possible with Turbo Native. So Today, you can already write uh, hybrid native applications using Turbo and Turbo native. Um, and Strata is just going to make that easier. It's not released yet, so there's not much out there about it. Um, but they say that when it's out, uh, you are just going to be able to remove code from your mobile application. So that's good, I guess. Um, yeah, this talk, we're going to make, we're mainly going to focus on Turbo. So let's dive in. I could just go over each of the, the techniques inside Turbo itself, but I thought it would be cool if I had a demo. So that's that's what I built. So I built a simpler version of Basic Camp. It's called Basic Camp. Yeah, little joke there. So as you can see here, this application is not using Turbo or anything. It's just a traditional server rendered HTML application in Laravel. And if I log in with the correct password, of course, then I can see my projects. I can create a project or I can view one project. It's all doing full page refreshes and all that. So that's good. Um, there's nothing, this is not all working, by the way. It's just the to-dos and the campfire that are working for now. Um, so yeah, this will be good to demo this, this thing. So first thing that we are going to do is install Turbo. So I'm going to this tab and I'm going to install Hotwire Turbo on it. Oh yeah, I have no slides. It's a live coding thing, so yeah. Um, so if now that it's now that it's installed, I can actually go to my app.js and import the Turbo library. And now I can start the Turbo process. So, and after that, I have to compile the assets. Come on. Okay. Now, if I refresh the page, I'm going to disable the cache just so it gets a new version of the assets. And now, I, if I click around, I'm with the XHR tab open. So I'm going to see every Ajax request being done. And now the application feels much more, uh, the transitions feels much more smooth here. So, yeah, we are going to work mainly on the to do's tab. And here we have a list of to-dos. And if I click on the add to-do, it gets me to the create to-do form. And then I can create a to-do. 
um, and it gets me back to the to-do list. So this is a traditional MVC application. Um, what I'm going to do now is it would be cool if instead of bringing me to the form to create a to-do to this page, it would be cool if the form would be already in here in the to-dos list. So after, oh, since we start Turbo, we can actually use some custom HTML tags. So in the index page here, I'm going to wrap my link with a Turbo frame. This is a custom HTML tag that ships with Turbo. And I'm going to give it an ID of create task. Just by doing that, um, if I refresh here and I inspect the element, I can see the Turbo frame is there. If I click on it, let me go to the network tab. If I click on it, I see the request was made, but nothing, the, the button's gone. That's because there was no matching uh, Turbo frame on that response. So nothing really worked yet. So now we have to go to the create to do's. I'm, I'm saying to do's, but it's task. So um, I'm in the create to do's form, and then I can wrap the form inside another Turbo frame with a matching ID on that page too. And just by doing that, now if I refresh and try again, I should see that the form appears uh, in line there on my list of to-dos. That's cool. But if I try to create a to-do, you see that something is up here. So there are a couple issues going on here. So the to-do is not stacked on the list. And the button reappeared here. That's because one, after we create the to-do, we redirect the user to the to-dos list page. And after that, it renders the index with a list of to-dos, which has a matching frame. So that's not what we want. But before we fix all this, let's see another problem. So if I control click on the form here, it gets me to the create to-do page, which by the way, this works really well if you have, this technique works really well if you have JavaScript disabled. So it gracefully downgrades for, to not having JavaScript um, to the way the application was working before you introduced Turbo. So that's cool. If we submit the form here, you see the validation message, regular uh, Laravel validation going on. But if we try to submit the form here from the index, you see that the, the button appeared and we don't see the validation messages. And that's because right now, that's because of how Laravel handles the validation exception by default. So right now the form was injected in the index page and we submitted that form, which triggered the test store handler and the validation was uh, thrown on that workflow and then it redirected us back to where we were before. So we, before we submit the form, we were in the index page. So it renders the list again, which has a matching frame with the add form. So Turbo will just replace the matching frame. That's not what we want here. What we want is that doesn't matter where we submit the form from. We always want to redirect back to the form that, you know, create task form. So the form re-renders with the error and it has a matching frame. So Turbo will know to update the, that DOM element. So yeah, we can fix that by going to the routes file and in the create tasks here, I can actually try catch this statement and I can catch the validation exception and I can re-throw it. But this time, instead of uh, redirecting back, I'm going to force it to redirect to the create tasks endpoint, which will render the form with the validation messages on it and all that. So I'm going to place this code inside this. And now if we try again on the form, on the create to do form, it should just work. But if we try on the index too, it also works there. So that's awesome. Um, and now we can actually fix the issue that I just described about um, if I create a to-do, it should appear on top and I want the form to re-render. Well, I want a new version of the form to be uh, appended or to replace the existing form, which is dirty. Um, 
So we can do that by changing this code here. I'm going to create a new view. I'm going to create a tool folder inside my tasks folder. And I'm going to create a view called created stream.blade. By the way, there's no package, nothing here. We're just using Turbo as it comes out of NPM. Um, so what I'm going to place inside of this uh, view, if I go back to the documentation on Turbo Streams, yeah. So I guess I, I should mention why I'm using Turbo Streams. So as we saw earlier, we have Turbo Frames and Turbo Frames are really good for updating a single portion of the page. But in this case, we actually want to update two portions, two parts of the page. So we want to update the tuple list, the to-dos list, and the form. We also want it updated with a new version of the form, which is in the clean state. Um, and for that, we can use tuple streams. And the, here's what you can do with tuple streams. So you can append elements to a target in the DOM, and this is a DOM ID. There are some pull requests to make this a CSS selector, but for now it's a DOM ID. So we can append this to the list of messages in this case, or we can prepend it to the list of messages, or we can replace an element, or we can update an element. Replacing will get rid of the existing element and add the new one in that place. While updating, we'll keep the element, but change the content of the element. So what we are actually going to do is I'm going to prepend the new to-do and I'm going to update the form with a new version. So I'm going to copy all this to that view and I'm going to delete the replace stream. Um, and in here, I actually want to change the target. So I don't have a message target, it's, it's a task target. And here I'm going to use a task partial that I have and I'm going to give it the task that I just created. Um, this partial is also the same one that is being used in the index when I'm listing the tasks. So if I go here, I see that there is a for each on all tasks and it includes the, the same partial. So that actually reminds me that I have to wrap this with a tasks div. Um, the tuber stream target doesn't have to be a tuber frame, can be just an element with an ID on your page. Um, so the, yeah, we had, we give it an idea of tasks and then in the tuber stream view, we just mentioned that we want to prepend this task in the tasks element. And also we want to update the create task form. And for that, we are going to pass the form, which is also inside a partial. So I can just reuse it. Um, and for that one, we have to pass a project which I can get from the relationship of the task I've just created. And I also have to pass a new model, uh, which I'm going to pass from the controller. Um, the form is just a regular form. There's nothing different here. So now in my route here, I can actually return that view. And how do I return it? Well. Let's go back to the application and then I can talk about the content negotiation that's going to happen. So any Turbo request that is done by Turbo itself, it's annotated with a accept header. So if you see here the header, it has this new content type of Turbo stream. So any requests done by Turbo will accept Turbo stream responses. So we are going to check if the header has it. So if this string exists in the request header, in the accept header of the request, which string, that one that we just copied from the DevTools. Um, let me import this. Something's going on with my imports. So if we just, uh, yeah, we are, checking if they had the accept header contains this string. So if it actually accepts tuple streams, if it does, then we are going to render the view that we just created. And for that view, we are going to pass the to do that the task that we just created and a new task, which is a new instance of the task model. This is just so the form can render nicely. Um, 
So we don't have this assigned yet, so let's assign it. And yeah, that's it. Let's let's try this out. I didn't have to refresh, but what happened? What happened? So if I tried to submit the form, something's going to happen. So if you check the response, first the UI, nothing changed. But if we check the response, the two streams responses are there, but nothing changed. And that's because we haven't changed the header that we like Tubo doesn't know that this is a Tubo stream response. So it, it assumes it's an HTML response and it tries to fetch, tries to find a matching frame inside of the response. So we have to tell it that this is actually a Tubo stream response. And how do we do that? Well, we render the view and we also add the header, the content type header, and we use the same one that we are using here. And now if we try it again, we should see. Yeah, so everything worked. The new to do is there and the form gets a new version of the form. So that's cool. Um, something that I want to do real quick is would be cool if we could add it to those in line too. So let's do that real quick. If I go to the to do's list and I Actually, if I go to the to do partial and if I wrap it with a turbo frame too, and give it an ID for this specific task. And now if I go to the edit form for the to do and I wrap the form, the edit form with also a matching turbo frame, the, the same one as each individual task. Now I get inline editing for the to-dos, which is cool. Um, so this is pretty cool. And that's pretty much what you can do with Turbo frames. Um, there is a lot of stuff more. For instance, I want if I wanted to eager load or lazy load the form here, I don't like I don't want the user to press. I want them to see the form right away as soon as the page loads. I can actually give the Turbo frame a source and pass a URL and it will, as soon as that turbo frame hits the DOM, it will immediately make the request and find a matching frame on the response. So this is cool because I could, for instance, in this, the Basecamp talks a lot about this. Um, I could cache this entire view with the turbo frame that lazy, lazy loads and I could serve the same view for all users and the part that it's actually specific for this user, I can lazy load it. Um, hey does that with its little trace um, in their home screen. And also I have an example here somewhere that I'm gonna show later that does the same thing. But so yeah, that's Turbo, turbo Frames, Turbo Streams, that's Hotwire. Um, as you can see here, the the, the controller or the, the route handler, it's actually a pretty verbose. I, I wouldn't like my controllers to all have this stuff. So that's why I created a package that eases all this um, content negotiation going on and where the Laravel should redirect routes to. Um, so there are some conventions there. Basically, you wouldn't need to try catch and redirect to the form. So there's a convention that if you use the resource routes, naming convention, um, any route that ends with a dot store will get redirected to its create version. The same way any route that ends with a dot update will redirect to the dot edit version. Um, and also you wouldn't need to do this manually. There is a nice uh, macro that we add to the request. So you can just check if it wants turbo streams. Um, and the same way for the response, you don't need to do this manually. You can just return response to a stream and pass it an eloquent model. So now we know that this, now, now we know where to look the partial for this model. So it will look for the tasks resource in an underscore task partial there. Um, Unless you have the, this exact same convention that I just created here. So if I if there is a turbo stream 
for created, updated, or deleted inside a tuple folder for the resource, it will use that. Um, and there's, there's more to the package actually. So if we go here to the top, um, I haven't talked about this, but I can also use WebSockets and broadcast my model changes to all users connected to the, to the page. And all I have to do is annotate, use this, this trait on my model and this custom HTML tag that we ship with the package. This will all be published to your assets when you publish the, the package assets. So you have full control over this. Um, this will authenticate the user to this channel and handle everything uh, permission related to broadcasting and all that. Um, we are using Laravel Echo, so you can use either Pusher or the Laravel WebSockets package. Uh, I have an example here that's live and it's using the Laravel WebSockets package. So if we create, like I, here I have a, a WebSocket connection and if I create a post on this screen, it should show up on the other screen. Yeah, you, see, you saw the post appearing, you saw the, the um, WebSocket message going on. And here you can see the two streams that went through the pipe. So um, <laughs> it's the exact same tuple stream that we return to the user from the controller. It's just like you, you have to, you can use it. You can either update the current user via WebSockets or you can update, feed the current user with HTTP with the response um, tuple streams and update only the other users with uh, broadcast messages from Laravel Echo. So that's cool. There are, there's also uh, a testing package that I wrote here and it gives you some niceties when you're testing. So this trait interacts with Tubo. You can make a Tubo request to a route and assert that you've got a Tubo stream response and assert that you have a Tubo stream for this action, for this target doing this action and all that. The same way you can make a Tubo native request. Um, I haven't talked about Tubo native just yet, but there are some niceties on Tubo native. So you can, you get a custom blade directive here to check um, if you, if this request was made via a Tubo native client or not. So you could render some specific style sheets for mobile or some elements for just for the mobile users or something like that. So there's all that. Um, this is it. This is Hotwire in Laravel, all the goodies. And one thing that I really like about this approach is that it makes uh, it makes simple things simple and complex things possible, which is a quote from Alan Kay. Um, so yeah, that's it. You're on mute, I think. I'm indeed mute. Um, yeah, I was saying um, it's it's pretty wild what you can do with um, uh, with all this. Do you know if there is anybody besides um, yeah Basecamp and and Hey, obviously, who are using these techniques already in production? Oh, Tony, oh, now, you, now, now you were mute. Yeah. <laughs> wow. This is remote communication. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, from not exactly hot wire stuff, like Turbo, uh, it's just like new stuff. But this technique is also being used by GitHub and Shopify to some extent, I think. This all yeah. goes back to the PJAX way of, of sending HTML and, you know, updating the page. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, pretty cool, man, pretty cool. Um, do you have any work yet to be done on the package or can people just use it and, um, and yeah, use all the things that Hotwire provides or do you still need to add some things? Yeah, I want to add some stuff still. And like, I have a, an open question on how to handle software deletes for streams um 
also some improvements that I want to make to the package itself. But I think it's mostly there. It's just I want more people to use it and you know give feedback and contribute as well. Um, also, there is a, the companion app that I just showed, this one, Tubal Oracle, which is live. It's also open source, and I'm going to add some more features to it. Like I have a shopping cart example that I haven't shown here. Um, there is also lazy loading happening here. So like people can see this stuff going and all that. So yeah, the idea is that I, I'm going to update this example application and even I even want to do the hybrid mobile app for this. So yeah, pretty cool, right. man. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for, for all the work and all the time you invest in this. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that uh, yeah, this this technique will gain some some more traction in the, in the future. So, thanks Tony, for me. thanks for uh, thanks again for uh, for being here. Uh, and yeah, until a next time, I'd say. Bye. Um, okay, with uh, that amazing talk uh, by Tony uh, Dom, we are going to have a five-minute break and then we'll have uh, Kevin on and he'll be talking uh, about a multi-tenancy strategy uh, that he likes uh, with using one database. See you in five minutes.
I should unmute. Here I am again. Um, hello, uh, everybody. Welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed that uh, little break. Uh, I'll bring on our second guest, and it's Kevin McKee. Hello, Kevin. How are you doing? How are you? <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. Uh, if I unmute uh, at the right time, then everything is good. <laughs> We're still learning. Yeah, indeed. Um, so, Kevin, um, for the people that don't know you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, yeah, the kind of projects you're, you're working on, where you're from, and uh, how you got into to Laravel? Yeah, um, I, my, I'm Kevin McKee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, which is right in the middle of the United States. Um, I My experience with Laravel, I've actually only been using Laravel since about 5.6. Um, I've had a, about a 12-year career in IT. Um, right now, I've, I've got a bunch of jobs I'm doing. Um, number one, I'm the, the VP of, of information technology at a, a commercial cleaning company here in St. Louis and across the U.S. Um, so we have some Laravel apps that I uh, help build and run there. Um, I'm also the co-founder of a Laravel single database multi-tenant application called Padmission, which is a um, it's an app that helps connect people who are experiencing homelessness to a place to live. It's kind of like a Zillow.com or, or for people who are, are currently homeless. Um, so that's a really exciting project. We're, we're doing some really great work. I'm super excited about that. And that app is really the uh, foundation of, of my talk here today on multi-tenancy. Um, and then if anyone, if you do know me, it, it would probably be from Laracasts. Um, I have a full series on Laracasts called Multi-Tenancy in Practice, where I talk about this approach and, and a lot of other things go a little bit deeper into this uh, single database multi-tenant approach. Now, before we get in, into the talk, I have one question for you. So the St. Louis you live in, is that like the St. Louis where Laracon happened a few years ago? Um, I do I don't think Laracon's ever been in St. Louis. Um, ah, okay. I've been in, in uh, doing Laravel since 5.6, so definitely not since I've been in the community. Ah, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, with that... A postcard from St. Louis Freak. I've got to get that. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. If I get that, I'll call the lawyers off, and then you're, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, if you're ready uh, with your talk, then the, the stage is yours. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Let's share the screen. I'll add it. And you're good to go. Yep, so uh, real quick, Freak just gave a great introduction, but uh, if you want to learn more about me, my website, kevinmckee.me. Um, we got links to all the things here. I do have a free um, course on contributing to open source. If you've ever wanted to do that, um, you can click that link here. And um, I also have a snippet style podcast, uh, less than 10 minutes for each episode, uh, if you're interested in listening to that. But um, let's get right into um, single database multi-tenancy. So um, what I'm going to do, I have no slides. We're just going to code. And what we're going to do in the next 30 minutes is build a single database multi-tenant app that uh, is fully functional and it's gonna be the whole design so that you could take this starting point and go build your SaaS application uh, from here and everything is gonna just work. You're gonna build your app just like you would build any other Laravel app except it's gonna be multi-tenant. So you can um, have multiple customers or multiple companies with their set of users using your app uh, but they're only seeing the data that belongs to them. So uh, there's three key components to multi-tenancy that we need to make sure we cover today. So uh, the data should be segmented by tenant in the database. So uh, when you're doing a single database approach, that means you're gonna have a tenant ID on all every or almost every table in the database. Um, secondly, you're gonna be able to only see the data that belongs to your tenant. So you can't see the data that belongs to another customer. And then lastly, you can only create data in your tenant. So if you're creating something, um, you're not going to be able to put it into someone else's instance. So uh, at the end, I have some FAQs we're gonna go over where uh, we talk about some of the uh, pluses and minuses of this approach versus multiple databases. 
Um, so we're going to do this with this um, Fire demo app. So um, oops, I should probably turn that off. Um, so Fire is, you guys have probably read Fire tweets. You know, you've, you've uh, been watching a talk like Tony's talk and thought, man, that talk, that was Fire. Uh, so that's what I built. This is a fake SaaS application that you and your team are going to use to collaborate on all the amazing things that you've uh, seen on Twitter or learned about in Laravel. So to give you a quick demo of what it's going to look like right now, this is just um, a shell of the UI where you've got a bunch of talks that uh, you can add a new talk. And then once you add a talk, you're going to come in here and look at all the comments that you and your team are going to add as you're talking and collaborating about this, um, whether it's a meetup talk or a conference or anything that you just did. So um, you might also, you know, want to collect some fire tweets. We're not actually going to build this, but um, you know, this would be, uh, this is the idea of, this is a SaaS application. You can imagine you want companies, you want teams of people all collaborating on, on things within the app, but my team shouldn't see your team stuff. So hopefully that gives you a good foundation of what this multi-tenant or, you know, SaaS design is that we're going to do. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to log out here. Um, and so the other thing I want you to know is this is aside from all the UI stuff I've done and I've done some, um, some controllers and, and everything, this is a standard Laravel eight with Laravel breeze. So I know there's a lot of authentication options in Laravel, but breeze is where we're starting from. Um, so it, they published all of the authentication stuff and we're going to dig into that right now. So the first thing we need to do if we're creating a multi-tenant application is create a tenant. So I'm going to create a tenant model and um, sort of um, artisan. I've got an alias for that. We're going to make a model for a tenant and I want a migration and a factory here. So we're going to do that. And um, so here's my application here. And uh, sorry, let's go back to the app. So the first thing we're going to want to do is, oh, and let me um, migrate my, whoops, my database. Okay. So we need to register for the application. Uh, this is your standard Breeze uh, registration. And I just need to add a company because we need to know what company is signing up for this and create a tenant for that. So if you go to the register view from Blade or, or from Breeze, sorry, um, you're going to see a notes here. Um, I'm just going to add the company value or the company name here as an input. So uh, now when I refresh the page, you can add your company name. So this is again, what makes it a SaaS application. This is a whole company that's going to be using it. Um, then all we have to do is go into the register user controller. And here, I'm not going to do validation. You would want to do that. But the first thing I want to do is, is make a tenant here. And uh, so let's get our model and we'll create it. And uh, we haven't actually created that in the database yet. So let's go to the create tenants table. And all I'm going to do is have a string for the company name. You're going to eventually build this out to be a lot more, but right now this is all I need. And then lastly, let's go to my tenant factory because we're going to be using factories. And I just need the name to be a Baker uh, company. So this is it. Let me migrate uh, fresh one more time. Okay. And so if we fill out this, I'm going to, let's use my SAS pad mission. And my name's Kevin, Kevin at Kevin.com. I'm not going to submit this just yet because um, let's go back to that uh, registered user controller. Um, I need to create this. So the name is going to be from the request company name. Ah, come on, Kevin, type. All right, so that's good. Uh, one thing I know is not going to work is I need to unguard that. So that should work just fine. And if I register here, cross your fingers, all right, everything seems to have worked. So I can see all this demo stuff. Uh, if we look in our database, we've got a tenant, pad mission, we've got a user, and oh, the one thing I didn't do back to it is uh, go to the registered user controller. I have that tenant. Now I need to set the tenant ID on the user. So tenant ID. All right. And the user model doesn't have that. So let's create the users table 
and we're just going to add a um, table for a foreign ID. And this is going to be a tenant ID on the user. Now, a couple things I'm going to do. I want an index on this because we're going to scope every query we make to the database to the tenant ID. So if you're going to have that as a where condition on all of your queries, then you're going to want an index. Now, as your application gets bigger, you might add some more complex indexes. But for now, uh, we're just going to do an index. And then I also want to make this nullable. And this is important because um, I want, in my case, to be able to um, have a super user. We're not going to go into that in this talk. It's in my Laracast talk, but a super user that can see data from every tenant. So if they log in uh, with a tenant ID that's null, then they get to see all the data, which is one of the really great benefits of this single database approach. So uh, let's migrate our database one more time. And that means I'm going to have to um, register once more. Let's go to register. And Admission, Kevin. And now we're in. And if we look at our database, now I've got this tenant ID of one, and I'm associated to this tenant here. So that's good. So if we go back to, we're just going to use um, this as our, as our grounding point. The data needs to be segmented by tenant in the database. So that's really where we want to start. And as we look at our app, um, Here's the next model we need to create is a talk, but we want to make sure this talk also is segmented by tenant in the database. So before we create it, let's use a feature that um, I don't know if a lot of people know about it or use it, but it was introduced in Laravel 7. And it's called the stubs. So if I do PHP artisan stub publish, this is going to create a whole folder. Let me show you this over here for stubs. Now all these red folders or all these red files, these were published. And this is what Laravel uses whenever you create a new migration or a new model or anything. So when we do uh, artisan make model with a migration, this is what is created. And so because I want my migrations to have this tenant ID, I'm just going to copy that from here and I'm going to put it into the stub. Now I don't want it nullable, but I do want it um, there. So now we have the tenant ID in the stub, which is great. Uh, the other thing, the factory, I want all of my factories to be able to have a tenant as well. So we have a tenant ID on the factory. And this is going to, um, if you're, if you haven't used this yet in Laravel um, 8, these, this is going to you know, spin up a new tenant if you don't define the tenant ID. And then we would just have to up here, use app models. So now when I go to PHP artisan make model, we want a talk and I want a migration and a factory for my talks. Now let's take a look. Um, create talks table. I already have a tenant ID on here. So this is so important because you're not relying on the, the developer to remember I need to put a tenant ID on this. Now Laravel is taking care of it for you and, and you can't mess it up. The other reason I really like this is because there could be some models you don't want to scope to the tenant and then you can just delete it, but it's always there by default. And similarly, we have our talk factory and this uh, now has a tenant ID there. So we're going to do our create talks table and let's fill this in. I've got a uh, snippet here. We just need a string, a speaker and a date. Um, or a string for the name, a speaker, and a date. And then we're going to go back to our factory and we're going to add that here. So I already added that tenant ID. So now we're going to have our faker, name, speaker, and date. So this is going to give us the ability to create some data. So let's do that now. We're going to go into Tinker and we're going to say uh, talk factory. Um, let's create uh, three times a um, talk, and we want to put it in tenant one. If we do this, um, oh, we didn't migrate our database. Um, exit. All right, migrate. Let's try again. There we go. So now in our database, we've got a talks table, and we've got these three um, talks that are there. 
And then if we go back here and let's do it again, but this time let's not pass in a tenant ID. So what this is gonna do is create um, three more and they're all in different tenants. So I'm logged in in tenant number one. So I should only see um, the those three talks I created for tenant one. So let's go and do that in our view. Uh, first, we have a talk controller. And so here's the index. I'm just gonna say talk. Uh, right now, I'm gonna do it manually. Where the tenant ID is one, we're gonna order by date, descending, and we're gonna get. Uh, and this is gonna be talks. Uh, let's import the talk model. And then if we go to our uh, talks index, this is where these demos are. Now I'm using Laravel blade components. This is, uh, you don't have to know about those, but it's a really nice way, especially when you're doing a talk to hide a bunch of code that where the markup is confusing, but I'm gonna do a for each uh, talks as talk. And we're gonna say talk list item. And if I pass in the talk, this is all gonna work. So this is in the source code, which is, is open source. Um, so you guys can see that. And then I'm gonna delete these demo ones. If I refresh my page, if everything's working up, oh, I didn't format the, if I go to my talk model, I do have a date here. So I need to um, unguard this and did dates equals date. All right, so now if I refresh, everything is working. So we've got our three, we're not seeing all six, but the reason we're not seeing all six that are in the database is because we just hard coded that. So in our talks controller, we hard coded where the tenant ID is one. And that's not what we wanna do. Again, you don't wanna rely on the developer to remember to scope every call to uh, the tenant. So what we're gonna do is create a global scope. So I always go to the Laravel docs, global scope, let's pull that up. Um, obviously this is recorded. I'm probably moving really fast for a lot of you guys, but um, this is going to be uh, recorded so you can come back and visit. Uh, so a global scope is just gonna apply some condition to the database on every single call. So I'm just gonna copy this example exactly. I'm gonna go up to my app folder. I'm going to create a directory for scopes and I'm gonna have a new file and this is gonna be a tenant scope.php. I'm gonna paste this in. This is not ancient scope, it's tenant scope. And what I wanna do here is just take this builder and say where tenant ID and here, I'm just gonna call it one. And then let me get rid of that. That's Okay, so again, I'm hard coding it here, but now uh, the only thing I have to do is apply the scope to my talk model. And we can do that in a booted uh, method. So we can say static add global scope. And then I just need to do a new tenant scope. So let's see how this works. If I go back to my app, um, let's delete that. Uh, if I look at the query that's being run, let me go back to my controller and where tenant ID is one, I'm gonna delete it. So all we're doing is we're getting the talks from the database, ordering and ordering them. And if you look here, I'm still only seeing those three and I still have this where tenant ID is one scoped on my query, which is exactly what we want. Now, if I go back to the talk model, and if I were to comment this out, now I'm gonna see all six. So um, as long as this is applied to my model, then everything's gonna work exactly like I expect it to. Um, so the only other thing now is instead of hard coding that number one, what I wanna do is get the ID, the tenant ID on the user. And so to do that, I'm actually going to create some uh, listeners. So let's exit here. Um, so artisan make listener, I want to use the session to hold the tenant ID and we'll talk about more why I like that in a minute, but we'll say set tenant ID in session. And we're going to make another listener that is remove tenant ID from session. And now we're going to go to the event service provider and we can hook into uh, native Laravel events. So there's a login event. And when this is called, we're just going to respond with set tenant ID in session. 
And then similarly on log out, we're going to remove tenant ID from session. Okay. So now in here, we just need to, uh, it, within this handle method, let's die and dump this event just so everyone knows what we're working with here. And let's log out. We'll log back in. And so this is what we get. We get this user. And so we can just access the user off this event and get the tenant ID from it, which is um, right here. So what we want to do is say session. And we're going to put a tenant ID. And it's going to be the event user tenant ID. Okay. And I did say, uh, so if the session has a tenant ID. Because there is an instance where uh, I don't want to set this when it doesn't exist. So we'll do that. All right. And then similarly on the um, remove tenant ID from session, this one's easier. All we have to do is session forget the tenant ID. All right. So let's make sure this is working. I'm going to go back here. Let's log in again. And I can see in the debug bar, um, one more time. Come on, why isn't it working? Um, set tenant ID in session. Oh, not, this is in the wrong one. This should be if um, event user Sorry, that was probably confusing for all of you when I did that. Um, if the user has a tenant ID, we're gonna do that. All right, sorry about that. We're gonna log out, log back in, and hopefully this is gonna work now. Here we go. So now the tenant ID is here in the session, we can use it. And so if we go back to our global scope, our tenant scope, all we have to do now is say session, ID. Okay, and we could wrap this in if um, session has an ID. All right. So now this is still working, and now as a user, I'm only ever going to see the data that belongs to me. So that is. Um, the really big important uh, piece of multi-tenancy. Now data is never gonna leak from one tenant to the other. It's really important. So uh, we have that working now. Um, what do we need to do now? Let's go back to our um, fire.test. So the data, data is segmented, number one is done. Um, the user should only see the data that belongs to his or her tenant. We've got that one. So now we have one left. A user should only be able to create data in his or her tenant. Okay, so if we go to the application here, we have this ability to add a new talk. So let's find that. It's in our um, index box here. And we have our add talk form. So I'm just going to go to this Blade component, add talk form. And uh, so we've already got this posting to a route. And what we just need to do is go to that talks.store. So talk controller. This is the store method. And what we need to do is uh, just take the request and we'll say um, talk create. And um, I think I have this actually. There we go. So I don't have to type all that out. Um, so we're just going to create the talk with the name, the speaker, and the date. But what you can see we're missing here is the tenant ID. So if I were to try to submit that form right now, it's going to throw an error because I didn't provide a tenant ID. So what I want to do is use this booted method to do a static creating. So this is going to take a callback. So um, we're going to pass in the model that we're working with. and before, so this is called right when I submit that form and Laravel sees, okay, this is the model or this is the entry in the database that the user wants to create. I have all the data before I submit it to the database. 
let me do something here. So that's where we are right now in the life cycle. And so what I can do is just say model tenant ID equals the tenant ID that's in our session. Okay, so before it's saved, it's gonna do this. And this is really important and really powerful. This is also uh, just one of the reasons this is so important is because it makes sure you can never even, like let's say I tried to pass in a tenant ID that was different from my tenant. Because of this, this would overwrite that even if somehow you didn't do your validation correctly and uh, that got through. When it gets here, it's gonna be overwritten by what's in the session, which is exactly what we want. So if we go back to the UI here, let's um, say we have a Hotwire talk from Tony and let's just give a date here. I'm gonna add the event and everything worked. And so you can see in our database now, let's do a refresh. Uh, the tenant ID was added from the ID that I had in the session. So um, everything works. You don't have to remember to add anything. If we take a look again at our, um, our controller, this is exactly how you would have created it if it wasn't a uh, multi-tenant application, but it is. And so this structure, is exactly what we need to make this app multi-tenant. Um, again, you would add validation. I'm not worrying about that just for the demo. Um, so we have this, uh, let me go back to our talk model and it's nice, um, but like, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna copy and paste this into every model I create? Um, the answer is no. Now we're gonna go back to our stubs and use that. Uh, but actually before we do that, um, I think this would be better in a trait. So why don't we go ahead and make a trait? Uh, let's go back over here. Let's add a traits fold directory. And woo, um, a new file. We'll call this uh, belongs to tenant. Um, and uh, all right. So now we have this. Um, this is belongs to tenant. Okay. And what we can do now is take all of this and just copy it and paste it in here. And it's almost going to work exactly. The one thing we have to do is we don't want to have a booted method here and a booted method on the model and potentially with other traits uh, that override each other. So instead of calling it booted, we're going to call it boot uh, belongs to tenant. This is a convention that uh, make sure that nothing gets overridden. So it's just boot and then the name of the trait. And then this should work. So now if we go back to our talk, we can just use belongs to tenant. We can delete all of this. And if we refresh our page, everything is still working. You can still see our queries are scoped to the tenant ID. You can see if I add a new one, test, test, uh, that one worked too. So everything is working um, just as we would expect it, which is which is really great. So if we were to click in here um, and try to do this comments functionality, I'm not going to do it in the interest of time, but um, you would build this exactly the same way as you would build any other application. So this structure, and it's, it's actually almost done. Let's go back and, and finish it off. So now when I create a model, what I wanna do is have this trait applied to every model. Um, I can delete the tenant scope since it's now in here. Uh, so let's go to our stubs and find the model. And let's just take use belongs to tenant. We'll put that right there and we need to import it. And uh, that looks good. So let's just do a quick test. Um, let's do a make, we'll say a talk comment. And we want a migration and a factory and uh, oops, make a model talk comment. What am I doing? All right, so the model, the factory and the migration were all created. So create talk comments table. We have a tenant ID already on it. Um, talk comment factory. We are relating it to the tenant. And then the model itself, it belongs to a tenant. 
the the scope to make sure you're only seeing data from your tenant is applied and the scope or and the uh, making sure that when you create data it only gets put into your tenant um, that works too so we're basically done with this uh, whole structure that we built in just about 30 minutes our application is a fully functional uh, we would have to go to the user model and um, add belongs to tenant now it's done. So now we have a, a multi-tenant application and uh, this is gonna work really well for most applications. Um, let me go to the end of my talk here. Um, I have a little FAQ section that I wanna cover before we get into any other questions. Um, this is single database multi-tenancy. Now this isn't everything. Um, if you wanna start you know, working with the cache and making sure you're caching stuff that is, uh, you know, tenant specific. You'd have to work on that as well. So it's not fully complete, um, but it is, uh, it's a great starting point. So why use single database versus multi-databases? Uh, my answer is speed and simplicity. I think um, this is easy and you fully understand it. I, I really like when I don't have to use a package for something because I can just understand the code. I wrote it all myself. I fully understand it. When you get into solving bugs, when you get into um, anything else, it's it's really important to understand your code. And no one's gonna un you're never gonna understand a package as well as you understand your own code. Um, so that's really number two here. Um, you're also probably familiar with Yagni. Um, you might get to the point where you'd start with a single database and have to migrate to multiple databases. Um, However, it, you may not be there ever. So let's not overcomplicate with multiple databases. Um, one other reason I don't have listed here though is what I alluded to before. With a single database, all of your database, all of your data is in one place. So if you wanted a super admin dashboard, like show me all of my customers, show me a count of all the talks that have been submitted. Well, if you're in hundreds or thousands of databases, um, I'm sure the packages that, that I know Spassi has a package for multi-tenancy, like I'm sure there's a way to do that, but you can imagine it's, it would be really difficult to um, make that query to a thousand different databases and compile all the data together and show it to your super admin dashboard. Whereas with single database, you'd never have to worry about that. It's all just there. Um, why do you store the tenant ID in the session as opposed to just accessing it off the user model? And um, that's, again, the reason I want that super admin dashboard where I can leave that as null. So I don't ever want to be looking at that and having it be null. The other reason is you do get into a little bit of complication with the Laravel, like going and authenticating a user and maybe trying to apply the tenant scope before it can. That can I've, I've had some bugs in that before. So uh, I found the session to be much better. And it's secure. Like don't, if you're doing this, the only thing I would recommend is don't use cookies as your session driver. So you don't want to store the tenant ID in the front end, make sure it's sitting on your server. Um, lastly, if you did want to explore a multiple database design, why would you do that? Uh, I, there's two really big reasons for me. Number one, if your app has so much data that, you know, just one tenant is going to have hundreds of thousands or millions of rows in the database, well, then you have all these customers and you've got tens of millions and hundreds of millions of, of rows in a single database, and that's going to slow your app down a lot. So if you're planning to you know, work with that much data, then multiple databases is probably the right approach for you. The other thing is what type of data are you planning to store? Um, if you're working with governments, if you're working with really big companies, or if you're working with really sensitive data, like personal health information or financial, like credit card numbers or something, um, your customers are not gonna want to hear that their sensitive data is in the exact same database as another customer's sensitive data. So if the nature of your app is to either work with governments or big companies or really sensitive data, my recommendation is to figure out now how to create a multi-database multi-tenancy as opposed to a single database. So that's it. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know I moved a little fast, but if uh, you know, feel free to reach out with questions and uh, go back and, and watch the talk again. 
or uh, watch my Laracast series where I go even, even more in depth on all these things. You're muted, freak. Not again. Uh, here, here I am again. So uh, thanks for that that excellent uh, talk, Kevin. Uh, I really liked it. I re I, I really liked like the simplicity of the uh, of the solution. It's just yeah uh, a, a few lines of code, a modified stuff, and then it's already multi tenancy. Uh, yeah, pretty... and, and like I said, th this is how my um, my SaaS app Pad Mission. This is our our um, approach. So this is not theoretical. It's it's live in production right now. Yeah, yeah. I think that yeah, a lot of people will find this very very helpful. And yeah, I totally agree with uh, the Yagni principle that you should start simple first. And yeah, maybe you just don't need uh, a more complicated situation. So I think that's very very good advice. Okay, Kevin. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, it was great. I hope you also had like a fun time giving it. Yeah. And, thank you for having me. And uh, I do hope that we'll see you at uh, at Laracons in uh, in the future. Should you should you like to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't wait. And you know, anyone here, if you're watching right now and you see me at a Laracon, uh, please come and say hi. That's actually the main reason I like to to give talks is because. Um, I like to uh, interact with people when we have these in-person conferences again. Mm -hmm. I find it, you know, it's a really easy way for someone who might not uh, feel real comfortable going up to a stranger, but a lot of people are comfortable saying, hey, you did a great job on your talk. So, um, you know, if you see me at a conference, even if I'm not speaking there, just come up and say hi. I'd, I'd love to talk to you guys. Cool. Yeah, I also hope that we'll have in-person conferences soon again because that's that's always better i think than like the virtual ones the virtual ones are nice to spread like um knowledge but in person is good to have like these human interactions and to yeah form bonds and friends uh. yeah i totally agree i can't wait to i don't think we've met in person freak i can't wait to meet one day yeah, I, I hope it's it'll happen maybe at the end of the year, probably probably next year. Uh, then we'll shake hands like people used to do in in previous yeah. years and uh, and have talk. Uh, or at least a fist bump or, or an elbow bump. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, indeed. Okay, uh, I'm going to close off, Kevin. Uh, thanks again for uh, for being here. Yep, thanks everyone. Okay, uh, that was uh, uh, Kevin with, uh, I think it was a really, really good talk. And we're at the end of the meetup. Um, I'm going to repeat uh, what I've said in the beginning of uh, the meetup. If you want to give a uh, talk at this virtual meetup, head over to meetup.laravel.com. Uh, there's a submission form there to propose a talk. And I don't care about like the length of the talk or the level of the talk. Everything is uh, is welcome. Um, I already planned a next meetup as well. Uh, it's also at meetup.laravel.com. It's on the homepage now. Uh, the next meetup will be at uh, the 23rd of February. My first guest will be uh, Stefan Baumgartner. And he will show some cool things that you can do with TypeScript. TypeScript is like this uh, yeah, amazing JavaScript language where everything is typed. And yeah, I think I can freely say that uh, TypeScript really blows uh, PHP's TypeScript uh, away. It's, it's pretty amazing. And my second guest will be uh, Frank Dior. Uh, Frank, he made an excellent uh, event sourcing library called Event Sauce, but most of you probably know him uh, from Fly System, uh, yeah, which is also uh, included in uh, Laravel. Frank uh, recently released a major new version of uh, Fly System, version two, and he will talk about the strange uh, about the changes uh, in uh, that. Um, in that new release. So I'm looking forward uh, to that as well. Uh, thanks again for joining and I'll hope uh, I'll see you again next month. Bye everybody, take care.